Short time. Okay. Um, welcome everybody to our Facebook Live. Again, just to remind everybody we're doing it Tuesday at 12.30, which is what we are right now. Just finished Pancreatic Conference. Uh, 11 interesting cases. Unfortunately, about one of them may have been a surgical candidate. The rest, all 10, had too much disease and will be undergoing different forms of chemotherapy or combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Uh, a couple of the cases, uh, I think in retrospect, going way back when, you probably could have picked up the tumor. Again, it's always in retrospect, which kind of brings us to today's topic. Um, what does AI really mean to radiology? And artificial intelligence, now better probably defined as deep learning, as something that's been around radiology forever, right? Uh, I remember when I started radiology, uh, they told me, don't worry too much about the chest x-rays. Within a couple of years, the computers will be reading all the chest x-rays. Well, we're still reading 200 to 1,000 or so chest x-rays or plenty films of hospitals. So uh, the predictions of what will happen often um, may indeed come true, but they may be off by about 100 years. But in saying that, deep learning is something you uh, read about every single day in the newspaper, uh, whether it's deep learning for trying to uh, develop driverless cars or it's deep learning for developing drones or is deep learning for choosing financial investments and, and choosing the right stocks in the stock market or it's deep learning in pathology to be able to read the path slides as well or better than even the best radiologists or in radiology where you see articles literally come up every week talking about where, CT, where computers can read mammography or read CT or read MR they can detect plaques on MR in patients with Alzheimer's. They can read chest x-rays better or as good as radiologists. They can do the bone ages as well, thank goodness. Um, and it's interesting that it really is driving a lot of people crazy. And there's an article, I think, in Press and JACR, where, where I won't mention the author's name, but you can read it if you go online to JACR and you look at their online first, which they do a good job of publishing the articles before they're actually in the journal probably five to eight months in advance. And he talks about how radiologists really need to worry that he kind of sort of said in the last paragraph that we're kind of like the horses when Henry Ford was building the Model T. And the horses thought they had it good until uh, the Model T came along and they were back to the glue factory. And his feeling was that radiologists is in the same danger okay, um, that we're really at risk for having uh, potentially being replaced. So first of all, I will say this, um, and all of you know this, some of you know it better than others because some of you have been around longer than others. Uh, change is the only constant, right? I remember when I started radiology, we had plane films and we had fluoroscopy, we had barbaric angiography, we did uh, translumbar punctures, we had some very crude nuclear studies, some gallium, some bone scans. I remember being taught how to read whole body gallium was to take off your glasses and see where the, uh, the Rorschach spots were. Whatever was hotter would be the right answer. And that did work. Um, and then uh, things came along like CT in the late 70s and uh, body CT really bloomed in the 80s. And then as body CT was really taking off, MR came along and you do remember MR was supposed to replace all body CT, which has never happened, but MR became an additional thing. Ultrasound over the years has gotten better. Nuclear medicine, new agents, new technologies have gotten better. PET scanning came along and improved what we could do, replacing some things, but adjusting how we practice. Angiography went from purely diagnostic specialty to a specialty that had to change as CT angio came along. And for the most part, you don't need diagnostic angio anymore. Um, angiography became an interventional. It's interventional radiography. It's doing procedures, whether it's oncology or it's vascular disease, across a spectrum of processes. So the one thing we are used to in radiology is the fact that things are changing. Okay, so uh, if, we, if, if we think that um, things will remain the same, that's not going to be the case. Now, no one does complain when things change and the scanners get faster, or the scanners have better resolution, the scanners have better detectors, they're easier to use, they're less complicated, no one complains when there's new software for doing 3D imaging, 
whether it's going from just volumes to cinematic or doing volumes and cinematic, trying to make the process easier so that people will use it. Nobody complains. Cardiac CT came along. We kind of were a little bit threatened, perhaps, by cardiology trying to steal our business, but they didn't. Changes occurred, but for the most part, radiology controls cardiac imaging because at the end of the day, we know how to do imaging. We deal with the technologists. We deal with the radiologists. We deal with referring clinicians. So we kind of have our thing, and we know how to do it. But now this deep learning, and like everything, there's a lot of hoopla, but I will tell you, a lot of what they're saying is indeed true. But the question is, what does it really mean for us? So let's take a good example. I mentioned I came from Pancreatic Conference. At Hopkins, we have a Felix project, and I'm one of the co-PIs. And if you go on Facebook, which you are, look yesterday, you'll see that there's a whole big plug about what we're doing and a talk I gave at the NVIDIA uh, meeting, um, and they interviewed me. And you could see about deep learning for early detection of pancreatic cancer. And in fact, I can tell you that we're going to be on NPR with that same topic being addressed in detail this Friday or maybe next Friday, but it's all been recorded. I guess it's in the process of being finalized, and hopefully uh, that will come out well. But I think what happens is that, um, let's say, and we're doing really good results. Alan Yuli and his team have really developed some good algorithms where we can pick up probably 90% of pancreatic cancers. We can pick up the small ones, the large ones, and we're getting better. We're learning where, what our errors are, and we're learning how to fix those errors. And let's say, for example, flip it out a couple of years, we're 100% accurate. We can detect every pancreatic cancer when they're small. Okay, well, now you say, is well, that's going to replace radiology. Well, not exactly. Because when we finish and we can pick up pancreatic cancer, it'll be great for the patients, right? Because we'll pick up pancreatic cancer early. Right now, less than one in five patients at presentation is a candidate for a section. Perhaps three out of five, that's just a guess. Don't quote me on that. Perhaps three out of five will become candidates for susceptibility. So we'll have better survival, we'll have better outcomes, better intervention. Okay, but how does that affect radiology? Well, in a sense, I have to read the whole scan. So even if someone else read the pancreas perfectly, I need to read the liver, I need to read the pancreas, I'm sorry, I need to read the liver, I need to read the spleen, I need to read the stomach, I need to look at the kidneys, at the small bowel, the mesentery, mesenteric vessels, aorta, and all the branch vessels. I need to stage a patient, I need to look for metastasis, I need to look at the whole scan. So if you think about it, even if we had the best pancreatic cancer detection system, and even if we had the best pancreatic detection system, and we're not just working on pancreatic cancer, we'll pick up cysts, we'll pick up pancreatitis, we'll distinguish autoimmune pancreatitis from a, a tumor. So let's say we do all that. But still, even if I eliminate the pancreas from your repertoire, you're still going to need to look at the entire scan. To think that a computer is going to be able to look at the entire scan, pick up every incidental finding, most of the time incidental findings are not important, but 5% of the time at least they are important. They can be tumors, aneurysms, things like that. You know, you're going to have to be there to look at the entire scan. You're going to have to be there to put together what the pancreas is doing with the other organs and what the entire disease process is. So I think if you looked at our experience, let's say the Felix Project, even if we're massively, massively successful, it's only going to change how you do things. It's not going to replace you. But you're going to look a lot better because that computer is going to be the world's best second reader. That computer will be your best friend because it's going to prevent you from missing a pancreatic mass when it's small, and it's going to help you well, by the time we finish with it not only picking up a mass, but saying what the likelihood of the lesion is, whether it's an IPMN or a serous adenoma, whether it's a cancer, whatever it could be, the computer will be telling you that. Uh, so it's really going to enhance your value. It's not going to diminish your value. And if you wanted to replace me or you reading CT scans, you need an algorithm which looks at the liver, spleen, pancreas, kidneys, stomach, small bowel, the nodes, the aorta, the iliac vessels, all the branch vessels, all the mesentery, the subcutaneous tissues, the bony structures, and you need all of that to do it within a couple of minutes with a high degree of accuracy. So you can see that um, I don't think we're at risk in that regard. Now, I will say that certain things are at risk. You think about mammography, 
If I was looking to do deep learning and be successful on something easy, I'd pick mammography. It's a couple images, one body part, one organ system. You're looking for something that doesn't belong, a calcification or something to, to, to that uh, effect. And also you're doing a lot of follow-ups. Every year you got to scan. So you're looking from time to time. Did it change from time A to time B to time C to time D? Well, computers are really good looking at temporal changes. So if you do have the slightest calcification that's appeared, if you do have a soft tissue change that's appeared, you're not relying on the user to make the definition of this interval change, but the computers are more likely to be able to be perfect at defining those changes. And then also being able to monitor the process. You can imagine the computer will then come up based on the appearance with maybe a risk score and say, okay, with this scan, you need a biopsy. With this scan, you need an MR. With this scan, you need a six month follow up. And with this scan, you need a one year follow up. So the computer will be gathering information on these deep learning algorithms. And we'll see, it will be taught millions of mammograms and what the outcomes are. The problem is it doesn't have enough mammograms at this point to really be taught that. And the algorithms aren't smart enough, but as algorithms get smarter, as you have more and more time, um, it's gonna do better. Now, let's say you did read perfectly the mammograms, the screening and everything else. You'll need less mammographers. Nah, that's no problem. But what will mammographers do? Well, in the beginning, they'll do MR. In the beginning, they will be doing biopsies. They'll be doing more procedures. Maybe on the therapy side, they'll be doing more procedures. So I think it may change the number of mammographers, but it surely will change what they do, but that's not necessarily bad. They'll also be doing the supervising. Every X number that the computer spits out, where it's not sure, you'll be able to look at those. So in MAMO, it may not just be a second reader. It may be the primary reader showing in screening. And we know a lot of people don't get screened or the screens are not looked at because there's not enough staffing and many of the poor areas around the country. And you can imagine a truck coming in, screening all the women with mammograms. The computer are basically reading them all, spitting out the ones that need intervention, spitting out the ones that it's not certain about. So we can really make this process much easier for our patients and much more cost effective. So the AI in that regard is gonna be great. Now, some applications you hate. How many people like new bone ages? Oh, give me strength. You have a hand, it's very important on a pediatric patient, right, the bone age. But it's a hand, then you flip through the book, the pages, you turn the pages, you turn the pages. Then you find something that matches, you say five years, three months. The computer can turn the pages a lot faster than you can. It can see through the pages. And it says five and three, you got the answer. Now you can have the radiologist look at it and say, yep, that works very well. And I'm very happy with it. So that's a good place to stop and say it works well. Now you can also do certain apps that perhaps with AI will make life easier and not necessarily cause radiologists jobs. Uh, there's an app I saw where they're quantifying the degree of plaques in, in multiple sclerosis to be able to predict changes earlier and treat earlier. There's an app which looks at head CT in the ER setting and puts the patients who have suspected bleeds to the front of the queue for the radiologist to read. Now, what's the worst case? The computer's wrong. Well, the radiologist is going to have to read the case anyway, but you know, you potentially can save, <clears throat> depending on where you are, a half an hour if you do it that way. So that indeed becomes a very good, uh, a very good way. Now, we can take some questions because I know it's getting to almost 14 minutes. Hello, Mindy and Jayhawk. Jayhawk is our outpatient center, which is about, which is where I am. So Mindy is a few hundred feet away. Uh, Amir wants to know a radiologist's jobs uh, be lost to AI. I think some jobs will be lost, but some jobs will be gained. I think it may actually make radiology a much stronger profession. A lot of the stuff we don't like to do, no one likes reading chest x-rays. We lose money on every chest x-ray we read. If the computer can read those chest x-rays for us, that would be just outstanding. We'd be making more money. You might eliminate a few jobs, but we need people to read body CT and body MR. So be moving people over. So I think it's going to change perhaps what we do. I think it will affect, as I mentioned, some people more mammography I'm thinking of, thyroid ultrasound I'm thinking of, lung nodules I'm thinking. And will it come into CT to PEs perhaps, to pancreas? Absolutely. To lung nodule detection? 
Absolutely. So there are many things I think that will come along that will enhance what we do rather than uh, basically put us out of business. I don't think about um, deep learning or artificial intelligence as a binary decision making. It's not like it takes our jobs, it doesn't take our jobs. Remember, we people write articles in radiology that say it's a 30% error rate. If you're making 30% of the cases errors and a lot of the errors are really consequential, we need to do better. If AI drops our error rate to 10%, we're gonna look a lot smarter, a lot better, and get this stuff done. So it's really very important that we um, really embrace the new technology. We need to help guide it because if someone just drops AI on your head, it's not gonna work very well, right? Because it's not gonna be integrated, it's not gonna answer the questions we need answered, it's not gonna do the stuff we need to do. So I think it's very important for radiology to be very involved. We're writing some articles, you can go to CT as Us. I mean, one of the things we're doing on CT as Us is developing an AI section with images and lectures and pictures. So we will be in that regard, you know, expanding our offering as well. I see Antonius is here from Athens. We'll say hello. And that really is um, my time for today. Unless anyone has any questions, uh, I, you know, but we will keep you up to date on deep learning and artificial intelligence. You see that I pu put a lot of stuff up on the Facebook page. We have a new section coming in uh, CTS Us in the recent future. And we're working on, we'll be working on some apps for deep learning. So we are very committed to being leaders in that field. And I think we're doing a great job. And with that, I'll thank everybody for their attention. Um, and I'll see you later. Have a great week. Bye.